Well, hello, everybody. Um, it's a real treat to be here again with an, ama an amazing panel to, um, to put the spotlight this time on mental health and well-being. And we've got a truly fantastic global audience with us to, to talk about this agenda. Uh, we've got, obviously, myself. I'm the programme director for the Nightingale Challenge. We've got Zhao, who is the founder and director of J.O. Mental Health, who's got an amazing story to tell us about how he's really invested time and energy in nurses and with a particular focus on mental health. We've got his colleague, Sally Ash, that's going to talk more about what happens in practice, along with Angelo. Um, we're hoping Deborah will be joining us. Deborah's a, a fabulous colleague of mine that um, is currently the chief nurse for social care in England, a, a brilliant job that really raising the status and profile of nurses that, that work outside hospital hospital settings. So it would be great if she can make it. Uh, we've also got Harriet, who I've met in person, who's from Uganda and an early career nurse that's done amazing work actually with young children and women um, within Uganda. So she's here with her expertise and supported by Professor Grace Edwards, who is um, a, a midwifery academic and has spent time not only practicing in Uganda, but also educating the next generation of midwives there and in the UK, no doubt elsewhere too, Grace. And then um, last but not least, my lovely dear colleague, Amina, the beautiful Amina, um, who actually came with us to the Pre-World Health Assembly. Goodness, Amina, I think it's two years ago now, that has really been able to invest time and energy in um, early career nurses, putting herself on an amazing career trajectory. And now she's the emergency department supervisor at Hamad Medical Center. So what a role model and inspiration to us all. So I think without further ado, we'll go now um, to our first speaker. So Shao, over to, I think over to you. Hi everyone, hello. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, it's an absolute pleasure, an absolute pleasure and privilege to be here with everyone with this a wonderful group of people and and also to join uh nursing now and the challenge especially at this period that i know the challenge is kind of transitioning nursing, uh, now challenge um starting our discussion um what i would like to do is maybe to tell you a little bit about uh giant mental health and what we do and why this challenge is so important to us um, and also about the challenge itself and what the prize of the challenge uh, is. So I am going to try to share my screen with you. And see. Can you see my screen? Yeah? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, so, so, so much uh, giant mental health and who we are. We are a UK um, and Asian based uh, NGO, um, offices in London and an office in Kathmandu in Nepal. We are founded primarily by nurses, not exclusively, but primarily by nurses. And we work for nurses and, and also other healthcare professionals. And our focus is on mental health, mental health being one of the most uh, neglected and forgotten areas of, of, of clinical care. Why do we do that? We do that because we know that almost three quarters of people that live in low middle income countries who suffer from uh, mental illness receive absolutely no treatment whatsoever. I mean, they have no access to mental health care support. And um, we know that there are severe shortages of qualified healthcare staff in countries like Nepal, for example, there are only three uh, qualified child uh, psychiatrists. There is only a handful of uh, mental health care nurses. So there are severe shortages of qualified healthcare staff, not just in mental health care, but in other areas of, of, of health care as well. And we also know that uh, nurses and midwives are an untapped resource that it's there and that it can have an immense um, influence and power on global health. 
um, and that's really what kind of drives us and drove us to uh, uh, to found uh, Jaya Mental Health. So what do we do? Our aim is primarily to strengthen nursing capacity in low and middle income countries, and we work specifically in, in South Asia. How do we do that? We do that by sharing and learning clinical skills, knowledge and resources. So we have most of our projects focus on training programs where we exchange skills with our colleagues in South Asia. And it's kind of a both ways process, a two ways process where we share and we learn. And it's also about advocating and empowering uh, nurses so they can have a role, an active role in, in global health. And our aim really, what we hope to achieve is to raise the profile of nurses, is to hope that employers and governments invest more in ongoing professional development opportunities for nurses and midwives and all other healthcare professionals who traditionally don't, uh, don't have those opportunities. And ultimately what we really want is to improve the care that is available to people who need um, healthcare support. And especially those, in our case, especially those affected by mental health and psychosocial problems. So our projects are very varied. We, we are quite a small NGO, but we work in three countries, in Sri Lanka, in Pakistan, and in Nepal. Uh, and we have kind of two types of projects. On one hand, there is kind of direct care delivery, where we have mental health care uh, outreach clinics, usually in remote parts of South Asia. Um, and then we have training programs. Uh, aimed at not just nurses, primarily nurses, but also um, other health professionals, including community workers who don't necessarily have a qualification, but who um, assume the role of health professionals where uh, these do not exist. And I'm thinking, for example, of female community health volunteers in Nepal who are basically uh, midwives. That's what they are dedicated to because there's huge lack of trained midwives and they assume that role. So we, we work not exclusively with nurses, but also with, with other professional groups, particularly those who have no qualifications. So the, the Nightingale Challenge, um, why is this um, so important to us? Uh, as an organization that is committed to uh, supporting nurses and midwives, um, we embraced this invitation of joining this challenge with, with open arms uh, because we are, above all, really keen to hear uh, from, from you, as in you panel and everybody else joining us uh, today, to hear about your, your journeys, to hear about uh, your path from student to qualified nurse to leader. Um, I think that very often, nurses are um, considered caring, they're considered inspiring, uh, we guide and support others, but I wonder whether nurses uh, see themselves and midwives as leaders. And I also wonder sometimes whether other health professional uh, groups look at uh, nurses and midwives as leaders or potential leaders. So we're really keen to hear about people's stories and also to get uh, some of your ideas uh, uh, so that we can find solutions, so that we can find ways of supporting nurses all over the world to, to become leaders, to inspire others and to have that um, active role um, of, of bringing positive change <clears throat> to healthcare. So what is the actual challenge? Um, I think that traditionally the past two uh, challenges that Nursing Now has done, there's usually one challenge as in one question. Uh, we have two, so you can choose uh, from <clears throat> one or uh, the other. So the first one is identify ways in which experienced nurses can support early career nurses as they transition from student to registered nurse. So this is one of the challenge that you might choose to respond to. The other one, which is similar but also slightly different, is to develop an approach or an initiative to support nurses as they transition student to registered nurse. Yeah. What 
we are doing today just to explain a little bit about the process so today is the uh, the first webinar which is the introductory webinar to to the challenge that we are uh, suggesting you uh, to take then on the 12th of may there will be a second introductory webinar um, where we'll be revisiting the 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 the, the, the questions the, the, what we're proposing to you you can ask us questions and we just look at the subject from a slightly different perspective and then the 31st of may is the deadline so uh, more information will be available if you have any questions on how to submit your proposal um, via the um, web page of the nursingnow.org slash nightingale and you can also look at the nightingale challenge global solutions initiatives facebook group you'll also find information there and that will be updated uh, constantly by by hannah and the nursing now the nursing now team so what is going to be the the prize so the winners the people who win uh, uh, the challenge uh, will uh, be given tickets to attend the icn congress which this year takes place in november and you know for obvious reasons because of the ongoing pandemic it will be a virtual meeting, uh, so uh, it, will, it won't be um, in person, but we will have tickets uh, for the winners to attend this ICN Congress, which this year is about nursing around the world. Really interesting, if you go onto that um, the site at the bottom, you'll see the agenda. It's a very long agenda, that's why I didn't put it on a, on a slide. Um, but it's 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 uh, it's very very exciting. So um, I hope this kind of encourages you to 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 join us. Okay, let me stop sharing now. Okay. So for today's um, webinar, um, we thought that would be uh, fun and it would um, nice and hopefully also productive and and um, informative to to invite people nurses and midwives from uh, lots of different parts of the world with very different experiences and to hear their stories of being student nurses or newly qualified nurses or their journey into leadership in the hope that some of these stories would uh, resonate with the people that are uh, hearing us uh, and also that can give you some ideas on how to respond to the challenge that we are suggesting today or to any other challenges that you might face over the next few months and the next uh, few years in your career as, as nurses. So uh, without further ado, I have um, a few questions for, for the panelists, for, for the group that are, are joining here uh, today. But uh, you know, I really would like this to be a very open discussion that the panelists ask questions between themselves and also people who are at home uh, hearing us that you also send us your questions so that it's really an interactive and interactive um, debate. Um, so um, I'll start uh, randomly. OK, I'll start randomly with uh, Amina. I'll start with you, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, Amina, can you tell what was your motivation uh, to become a nurse? And you obviously are in a very um, important position at the moment in the emergency department in Qatar. Um, how do you think you, you know, where will you be in, in, in 20 years time? This sounds like an interview. It definitely isn't an interview, but I can see that you're quite young and you've, you know, achieved a lot. And it would be really interesting to see, you know, what was your experience before and what comes next for you, or what would you like to come next? Amina, I think your microphone is on mute. Sorry. Uh, first, uh, in our country, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is very nice, actually, and I'm very happy that I'm with you today. And uh, thank you very much to invite me for this uh, panel. Um, if I will talk shortly about my experience, I started actually uh, when I joined nursing in Qatar. Qatar is like um, uh, more than 80% of our nurses here in Qatar, they are uh, expats from different uh, nationalities. We have very less, maybe 
less than three or two percent Qatari nurses we have. So uh, part of our uh, country motivation for nurses, uh, they are doing a lot of like, you know, um, um, advertising that we need nurses, we need physicians. Um, I was interested in this. Uh, it was not, in Qatar, it's like, it was still like, uh, the nurse is not that good post to be, or to be a nurse. But my family, they supported me in this. And I started my career as a nurse with diploma first. We don't have uh, BSN that time in Qatar. When I finished my BSN, I started the, as a staff nurse um, orientation for one year. Uh, I love to work as emergency nurse. Then I changed my career to ICU nurse. And then again to emergency nurse. During this time, actually, uh, the thing which has supported me that the country want to return us in this job. Uh, they want us to stay in a clinical. They don't want us to go to admin work or away from the clinical, especially we are less Qataris. Um, maybe there was not much support I, I found at the beginning, but uh, lately, like um, the last six years or five years, the things change here toward nursing, toward the um, medical, like, medical profession. Uh, I, I, was, I joined ICN in 2019 and I met good people there, uh, good connection with Lisa and uh, I, 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 everybody. Like it was a nice support and to know the nurses all around the world, to know their experience and how they are working. And I felt, felt proud that in Qatar we reached to this level in nursing. I pursue my BSN and my master here in Qatar. Um, uh, you know, I felt the most important is to be always updated, to study more, to learn more. Until now, I love the clinical more than me, even if I am like now in a managerial position, but still I am with the patient, following the quality of care, following the length of stay, uh, how we can improve our quality of care for the patient in our emergency. And still, I don't want, like even after 20 years, wherever I will reach, I don't want to leave the, the clinical. Still, I want to be in the clinical. What I'm wishing like from everybody, like we need to support each other, especially like the mentors. I learned the word mentor, mentors when I went to uh, Geneva last two years. I heard about mentors how you can be like, uh, uh, have somebody to teach you, to show you the path to, you know, even for your mental, mental support, you need somebody to explain your fear or uh, how to do this or whom you can go back and ask. And really that time they show us how to do it. And till now I have a mentor. Like every time I will find a good person whom I can learn a lot, I will ask him if he can be my mentor and learn from him. So Amina, can um, I ask you something? So do you have already that system of, of mentorship in a country like Qatar? Does it exist? And if not, what do you think, how do you think, I'm thinking maybe of, you know, there will be uh, people in, that are listening to us that are in countries where maybe mentorship is something that doesn't exist yet. How do you think we can kind of encourage uh, people, uh, you know, our, you know, managers and, and hospital directors in countries like Qatar to, to explore this idea of mentorship? Yes, the mentorship, actually, we were not having this before here in Qatar. Like, uh, uh, only maybe last year, we, um, our CNO uh, started this, Ms. Dr. Nicola Ray, if you know her. Um, she's our chief of nursing officer in Qatar and gladly she was very supportive to us and started this mentorship program. Uh, we had um, people from uh, Florence Nightingale uh, Foundation, they came to Qatar, uh, they delivered for us a lot, uh, like uh, two courses here in Qatar for the Qatari nurses and the new nurses. Um, for each one of us, they given us the um, our career development plan, uh, we sit one by one with our uh, chief of nursing 
and our directive supervisor, and they implement this. Like everyone should have his mentor and work with him to develop you our uh, professional uh, development plan. So it was successful. Still, we started like one year, but I'm seeing the difference on me now. I have somebody I can go back and ask. I have, if I have anything that I want to learn or I can share with them. And really, um, it is a big difference when you have a mentor. And I encourage all the countries actually, like they, they should have a mentor. And to share. Thank you, Amina. I think Lisa, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. I just wanted to speak really to say, I think Amina has developed amazingly since knowing her back in 2019. And I think there's a few ingredients in there that's made her as successful as she is today, but still with loads more to give. I think the mentorship piece um, from the chief nurse was really instrumental um, in, in actually having that vision for Amina and her early career nurses and giving them lots of opportunities to, to step up to the plate. But, but I think as well, it has to come from you and Amina you know, you came to the pre-World Health Assembly, you mixed with people, you engaged and you were hungry and willing to learn. And I think that's another another key sort of ingredient uh, to being able to go out and make a difference. And the fact that you're leading nursing in an emergency part, you know, in an emergency department that's been quite male dominated in the past is just fantastic. So I just really wanted to chip in and say, you know, so proud of you and you're an absolute role model to early career nurses everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I'm learning from you. <laughs> thank Likewise. You. Thank you. Thank you. Mina, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And, uh, you know, it's, I think one of the fascinating things, and, and I'm very excited about this discussion, is just because we come from so very different parts of the world that, I'm sure that you know, that there will be similarities in the obstacles that we uh, uh, find along our way, but then huge differences, isn't it? And, and, and yes. that's so, so interesting. So thank you yeah. very much much thank you thank you very much you're welcome um professor grace um you have a, a really interesting experience as well of working both in the uk and in uganda for five years uh as a midwife you, you've been teaching midwife in, in both countries and you just explained just before we started that you're still engaging in 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 long distance education with with your colleagues in in Uganda. Tell us a little bit about that experience and also what you see in Uganda and how that compares as well to the experience of midwives in the UK, that progression and the kind of the obstacles that, that the midwives face in Uganda versus what happens in, in the UK and other places. Okay, thanks, thanks very much for that. And Amina, um, very nice to hear your story. It's not dissimilar to Uganda. It's very similar in Uganda. So shukran shazila for your story. Um, yes, yeah, so when I first went to Uganda, obviously um, I'm not as young as Amina, although you didn't say that to me, <laughs> that you look young. <laughs> so I was very experienced when I went to Uganda, um, a lot of clinical experience, I've always maintained my clinical practice and a lot of academic experience. And I'd really researched uh, low income country and the effects of that on maternal health. I was nowhere near prepared. When I, when I got there, I was totally, totally overwhelmed by what I saw and what happened and how, you know, how nurses and midwives had to work so hard to provide even the basic care. So mental health was never a consideration. And I really struggled with my mental health when I first got there because I thought I couldn't cope with the pressure. And it was quite interesting because the students I had then, and Harriet was one of those students, they helped me to transition into dealing and coping with the situation in Uganda in terms of maternal health. So what I was going to say to Amina is that um, mentorship uh, is really a partnership. You know, you both, both you will gain from it. And I'm actually Harriet's formal mentor through the ICM mentorship program, but we're very much a partnership and I've learned as much from her as she's learned from me. So you'll be interested to hear her story. So that you're never too late to be mentored or to have a mentor. And especially when there's uh, cultural sensitivities that you may think that you understand and you don't until you get there. And, to, and you'll probably find that in Nepal and in um, Pakistan and Sri Lanka as well, until you actually experience the culture and 
the effect that it has on the care of, of both nurses and midwives and patients, then you don't truly understand it. So I'm hopefully very humble about the experience that I've had because I've learned so much from the students as much as they've learned from me. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It, re it really is an, an exchange, isn't it? And that's why, we, you know, when we talk at Giant Mental Health of the work that we do, I think it's so important for us to emphasize that because, you know, we really want to avoid uh, that kind of almost neo-colonial approach that what comes from the West is, you know, what's right for other parts of the world. We, it's really an exchange. Everybody's learning. We all benefit from that, from that partnership that you were describing. And that's really at the basis of, of what we do uh, throughout our programs, throughout our training programs, where yes, we have volunteers coming in from all parts of the world going to South Asia, but also vice versa. And it's a win-win situation for both sides, isn't it? So that's in the work that you're doing. You'll be very interested in the work that Harriet's doing. Yeah, I'm, I'm keen to I'm keen to, to hear to hear well what, what you know based on what you were saying now and also about the, the, the experience of mentorship. Is is Harriet with us? I can't see uh, yeah, she's on yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Harriet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Grace. And uh, Harriet, um, your your um, phone is on mute. Harriet, hello. Yes, please. Really, really good to, to, to have you. Can you can you hear us well? Yes, I can hear you. Super, super. So, Professor Grace was just uh, uh, telling us about you having worked together, and Professor Grace was your your mentor. Um, can you tell us what, what you're doing now in, in Uganda? And in what way has mentorship also helped you in, in, in you know, the last few months and, and your career as, as a midwife? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, part of this webinar. I'm Harriet Naiga from Uganda. I'm a midwife of seven years of experience now. And Dr. Grace is my amazing mentor. She has mentored me for over three years now. The relationship is amazing. I can highly recommend that there is no way we can grow, especially us, the nurses and midwives. These professions have been suppressed. We need mentorship to come out of the closed departments where we, uh, we were to grow, to have that strong system support and mentors can focus seeing us grow because the experience I have with Dr. Grace, she's so much interested in seeing me grow professionally and in other areas of my life. I have found myself sharing a lot of life experiences with her because of the strong bond that we have created. So mentorship say it is a partnership it's a mutual benefit we use uh, she usually says that she has learned a lot from me and then i ask myself what has dr grace learned from me really and it's so amazing we enjoy the relationship so i want that i didn't say intro what i do in uganda um the founding director of me what milkot is a community-based organization that is seeing at bridging the gap which is existing between the midwife and the local community through provision of sexually productive health and to marginalize adolescents, young adults. Well, it was born out of my vision after realizing and noticing that many mothers were dying due to complications that can be prevented and especially the young people who are marginalized and have no access to sexual reproductive health information. And so adding to that, I, I highly recommend the early career nurses to be so focused on having a purpose in life, uh, to be problem solved, uh, who can identify problems, search for solutions. Having a purpose is very, very important because it's so fulfilling. Because as nurses and midwives, we are, we are chosen to serve and we are serving it. That's 
because of the place where you are, despite of the mission, we are serving humanity, something that we love. And what is motivating us today are the challenges that have been impacted by COVID-19. So this is the best time for us nurses and me to think outside the box because the world right now is more than 9 million. That means highly demanded and we have to think differently. So the more we think differently, the more the challenges that we shall solve. So my leadership experiences is a journey because I'm a growing leader. It is a journey and I can define leadership as being so tough, but the most fulfilling, very fulfilling in a way that I learn every day. I learn every day. I learn from the people around me. I myself, in my leadership experience, I'm a team player. Right now, I have uh, mobilized a board. I'm so happy and privileged of that, that I can mobilize the develop board above people who are highly professional, highly qualified, and they are of high profile. And I, in my capacity as a young midwife leader, who am I to lead them? So it is all about being proactive to see who can benefit me, who can I work with to achieve money goal and to serve the community. So in my community where I work, I have learned um, as nurses and wives have been neglected away from the center of the problem, especially in the community. We have not been identified in the community people who can solve challenges. So I'm showing to my country that as a midwife, I'm the center of care, even in primary health care. Now, when we identify marginalized adolescents and young adults who have failed or who do not have access to sexual reproductive health information and as midwives are able to assess them. And right now we are implementing our Nightingale Challenge project and it is aiming at building resilience of nurses and midwives as provision of effective and efficient service deliveries that teaching them the skills to provide adolescent friendly health services focusing on preventive initiatives and responding to patients. So I have, I and my team have mobilized a team of nurses in our community who are working in lower level healthcare facilities and those are government and private care facilities. Mm -hmm. Building them in leadership and also providing them with the skills on how to work with the young people and especially the key populations to turn away from the judgmental approach, but to provide the services without judgment. So we are saying that these nurses and midwives are cherishing in our approach. They have been inspired by me and the team. Dr. Grace has been part of the trainers. And then I also, I'm also having uh, Cliff Asha Alida, who is the head of secretariat of nursing now in Uganda. These are very, very supportive to meal court team. Mm -hmm. So uh, about health, is a challenge that has been negated. And as part of our Nightingale challenge, we have still trained nurses and midwives on how to screen mental health problems among the marginalized adolescents and young adults. Mm -hmm. And this yeah, yeah. is so amazing. This is so amazing because the system, healthy systems do not include mental health. And yet in the community, uh, the population is finding uh, pressing challenges that cause mental health challenges. For example, the marginalized adolescents. These are young mothers who have been neglected uh, by family, have been neglected by boyfriends, they are having HIV, they're doing sex work. When we assess them, we find that they have depression, 
they are stigmatized. They are finding grave discrimination. So mental health comes in a way, if we go down to the grassroots, assess them, and then refer to court Center, where they can get uh, psychosocial support from mm. clinical clinical oh, yes. psychologists and midwives. That is a way of approach that I would think that governments and health systems can buy to see that we care for mental health um, mm -hmm. challenges in our communities, in our countries. Harriet. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, well, I, 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 you know, I, I'm, we must chat afterwards because I'm, I really want to find out more about Milcott. It just sounds amazing. And I really want to congratulate you for, 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 for creating this organization. I do have a question for you and also for Professor Grace, as I was listening to you talking about midwives and nurses. Um, and, you know, you two are the, you know, representing the midwives in this small group that we have here today. Um, how is that relationship in a country like Uganda? How is that relationship between nurses and midwives and even uh, mid between midwives and other professional groups? Uh, is it a positive one? Uh, is it something that contributes to the, the, the professional development of midwives? Or do you sometimes uh, face obstacles maybe generated by other professional groups that make uh, uh, the life for midwives a little bit more uh, difficult. How, how is that relationship between between the various different professional groups? If I could just start with that one then, Harriet. Um, one of the big challenges in Uganda is the nurse-midwife ratio for patients. It's massive. You know, so I can't remember what the exact number is, but it's, it's sometimes like one nurse, 6,000, I think, patients. So there's big pressure in that one. It's also quite hierarchical. So the medics are considered to be top of the top of the chain, even though the midwives have more autonomy than I've ever seen anywhere, anywhere I've worked. But um, the nurse midwife relationships are generally very good because most nurses are midwives. So they have dual qualifications. And at Haga Khan, we train the nurses to have the midwifery skills because often they may be the only health professional in a community. So they, they, they transition very easily to each other's roles. But the biggest challenge is the nurse and midwife ratio. In, in the concentration is too young, physical. Not and Professor well. Grace, does that, the fact that there aren't enough uh, uh, midwives, uh, does that create opportunities for midwives to kind of progress in their careers and to um, welcome new responsibilities? Or it actually hinders them because they're just overloaded with so much work that they can't, can't actually invest in themselves professionally? Um, I think a bit of both. I think a bit of both. And what Harry is a example of a, a, a young midwife who's actually taken the baton and ran with it because she saw the gap in you know, the mm. physical, purely physical care that we give in Uganda. And she realized that there was much more care that should be given, particularly mental health support. So I think she's a very good example of that. It can be done and she's, she's really making an impact in the community in a good way and the medics are very respectful of her work because they realize that she's providing something in addition to what the physical care is in hospitals so she mm -hmm. might want to add to that harriet nice to see your lovely little face by the way There's some noise in the background i don't know if it's affecting so much we, we can That's hear just... you harriet. we can hear you Thank you so much. So relationship between nurses, nurses and midwives, um, as per my experience, I see that we are seeing ourselves as uh, having equal opportunities. The fact that we are working closely together, nurses and midwives, you uh, sometimes, or many, many times, you will find nurses doing midwifery work or nurses or midwives doing uh, mid nurses work. So because of the different roles that are being played, uh, they bring us together and to see that we are doing the same work. We are doing the same work. And so there is no way to, to have a big difference. That is my experience that I have seen. But I look at uh, midwives, these are people uh, 
these are the people who are seeing themselves to be working so hard. They are so strained. They are so strained. And when you look at, at the people or the profession that really gets tired when you ask them questions, how do you find the midwifery profession? Many of them want to run away from the profession because of the type of work they are doing, the, the, law, the workload that they have, and nurses, for them, there is flexibility. There is much flexibility in the work that they do. But we closely together, I will say that we have that much difference. So have equal opportunities. Mm -hmm. It's really good to hear that, that that support exists, especially if there are uh, so very few uh, uh, professionals on the ground, right? Because I think that's when networks become so, so important and, and, and so supportive. Uh, thank you very much, Harriet. Thank you. And again, I have to stress, I really want to talk to you more about Millcott. I'm really interested in hearing more about that amazing work that you're doing. Um, Salesh, uh, uh, Salesh, you are, you have a very different experience. I know you can obviously be different together, but I was thinking as I heard Harriet, Professor Grace, and especially Amani talking about her experience as a female nurse in a kind of a male-dominated environment. I, I know that you have um, a very different experience. Your journey through uh, a nursing um, as a male nurse in a kind of a female-dominated uh, um, healthcare system has been quite different. Do you want to tell us about it and what kind of obstacles and opportunities you found in that journey? Yes, thank you, Zohar. Uh, good morning and namaste, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, briefly about myself. I'm Sailis Pandari from Nepal. I'm a registered nurse. I completed my bachelor's in nursing from uh, Bangladesh, Dhaka, in year 2014. I worked as a critical care unit uh, for one and a half year at bedside and was later promoted to a charge nurse and uh, got the opportunity to work for at least two and a half years there. I returned to Nepal in the year 2017. Uh, I always had a keen interest to work uh, in the rural communities of Nepal. Uh, also, I was aware that Nepal, uh, where that time Nepal was not having any opportunities for male nurses uh, to work in the hospital. They have just started from last year, the nursing program for male uh, nurses. So I was aware. So I also completed my master's in public health when I was uh, about to return. Uh, st then once I returned, uh, I got um, opportunities for many interview, but uh, I was rejected because I was a male nurse. So uh, working in a hospital was very difficult for me that time. Uh, I got opportunity to work as a part-time lecturer in a private college. Uh, so I used to uh, be a part-time lecturer at one of the private colleges. Uh, teaching leadership and management to the nurses. Uh, but when I was in Bangladesh as a fresh nurse, I felt the great need of upgrading nurses' roles as it was very limited. Uh, nurses were much involved in assisting doctors, taking direct orders from them, restricted to work independently, uh, it, it, though they had a huge experience in their field of practice. And I used to always feel that we can we can work independently and grow as a professionals so due to such practice nurses had very restricted uh, rules completely different from what i have learned from my nursing school when i was a student and i must say that i was uh, very much motivated to nursing profession because uh, i knew that nurses could make a big difference in one's life in the area of their work and uh, mostly from my uh, my uh, mentors or uh, lecturers were my teachers. So most of them were volunteers from different parts of the world. They were so passionate about uplifting the uh, standard of nursing practice in the developing nations. Uh, so they were great um, motivators. The way they believed in their student was really something that made me feel that uh, there is a great need of teachers and mentors in nursing professions. And I used to always dream that maybe one day uh, I, I want to be like them. So once I started working in the field again in the uh, uh, 
in the hospitals, uh, there was a lot of challenges that I used to face, like being uh, a male was not a problem in Bangladesh, but uh, trying to trying to bring new practice because there was a lot of uh, old practices going on, like the limited roles. So the nurses were much uh, used to that practice. And uh, there were a few other uh, colleagues of mine who we graduated from the same university. And we always used to question why a nurse cannot do these things. Like nurses could present at least a case uh, presentation in front of the doctors, but the, the doctor had much of the power so nurses had to just stand by and just follow their direction or hand over them the files, stethoscopes. So we were uh, not happy with what we have learned and not being able to, uh, you know, like perform what we have learned there. But gradually we started slowly uh, applying what we have learned there. We started presenting cases to the doctors, giving them the uh, 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 night uh, night experience, uh, the, the, experiences that patients are problems the patients were facing. We got a lot of uh, criticism, outlashes from the doctors that you as a nurse should not be speaking this much, uh, your role. So there were a lot of those things happening there, but uh, we had to be very strong and just uh, continuously kept doing what we are doing. So Alex, can I ask you, sorry to interrupt, can I ask you, so specifically that example that you gave, that, that you know, the doctors will tell you, you talking yeah. to the you know, how did you respond to that? How did you actually in practice would deal with the, because I think that's a situation that probably a lot of people do experience. Uh, because we work in such hierarchical structures, a lot of people work in home, it's very difficult to, you know, find the courage to, to, yes people have um you know job insecurity etc so can you give us an example of how you dealt with that actually uh, it was not a the, like a one day thing that i went there first day and started doing that it was uh, like over a period of time first when we went there and uh, found that there were a lot of things that nurses were uh, not uh, you know, having the voice and not able to do. So we had to gain trust of the staff and colleagues. So we started by uh, just doing our roles, trying to organize the ward, arrange the files, make something in order. So the colleagues and staffs were also uh, some in some way uh, feeling that they are also um, uh, doing something for the betterment of the nursing. And then there were problem arising because of those things. There were a lot of uh, gaps in the practice. The doctor would tell something it was not properly recorded or the nurses were not having the opportunity to give it back to the doctors. So there were a lot of uh, gaps. So slowly we started uh, by, uh, you know, like documenting things uh, and going to the doctors and just uh, explaining them the, the what, what, what is, patient going through so mm -hmm. slowly slowly it took a very long period of time so it was not a one day thing that we came and just said the, those things it was but a process it was that a process. was a long long process almost mm -hmm. uh, after uh, being in a new hospital for six months and then slowly after gaining some trust and again gaining the trust from the patients and the patient uh, family members so they found uh, the way that we uh, we're talking with the patient, providing them health education, which was uh, not much done or done by the doctors. So mm -hmm. doctors also sometimes used to feel that, uh, okay, the nurses uh, can do those things. So they can, they can have that trust also. So that made it a little bit easier for us to, you know, uh, after knowing that that was the safe place, then only we could uh, go to them and then discuss mm -hmm. those things. So, I think Professor. I think Professor Grace has a question. Professor. Hi again. Yes, I just wanted to reinforce what Salish is saying. And one of the things that I found worked in Uganda. We had exactly the same situation. You know, the, the nurses were told by the doctors that they weren't to interfere on on decision making. And one of the things I'm very keen on is evidence based practice. And by making sure that the students are armed with the right evidence, they were able to go back and and challenge practices, but not challenge in a personal way, but just say, oh, doctor, did you know there's a Cochrane review on this? Maybe we could share it with the rest of the staff. And I think that that worked really well in terms of accepting that there was evidence that was outside of, outside of their realm 
and it didn't become a personal battle between the nurses and the doctors. So it was one, one, one uh, tactic that I found very useful. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's a really, really important point because it kind of it doesn't make it personal. It's, it's not about personalities, it's about evidence, facts, which is probably one of the strongest tools that we can that we can use, isn't it, when trying to introduce or suggest some changes to, to practice. Silesh, thank you very much uh, for that. And you know, I'm I have to say that working with Silesh is you know an absolute privilege. Silesh is a one of the Fantastic nurse. It is, um, it's a privilege to have him in our team in, in, in Nepal. So thank you, Salesh, for, for joining us. Um, I'll move on to Deborah. Deborah, uh, you are somebody with um, a very special, incredible um, story. Uh, you know, throughout your life, you've, you've worked as a nurse in various different positions. I'm sure you've met quite a lot of people, some nice, some not so nice. Uh, and what I wanted to ask you is for you to tell us a little bit about, about your journey and also what kind of advice would you give to a young nurse that is just qualified, has just joined her new or his new post uh, and doesn't know what to expect? What, what, what do, you, do you say to them? Okay. So um, my, it's really lovely to be with you uh, this afternoon. Thanks to Joao and to Lisa um, and Nursing Now and the, the, the Nightingale Challenge uh, for inviting me. So um, I've been a nurse as of um, September. It will be 40 years since I started my nurse training. So a very, yeah, I've got a few years under my belt. I've got a lot of experience and I've certainly met um, a lot of people during that time. And I'd always wanted to be a nurse. So I was that five-year-old who always wanted to be that, be a nurse. And I have to say, it's been a career of great privilege um, and also huge opportunity. I chose very um, early on in my career to work with older people and people living with dementia. And that was actually um, sort of, uh, the reason I ended up following that path was I was so appalled at the care people received as an 18-year-old, those old older people that I looked after the kind of dehumanizing of them, um, the lack of respect um, just, just really frustrated me. And I remember going to my tutor as an 18 year old and saying, if this is what nursing's about, I can't do it. And he said to me, well, you've got two options. You can leave or do something about that. So I had it in my head um, that I really wanted to make a difference to the lives of those people. And I've been brought up by parents and kind of instilled with a very strong sense of social justice. So you should always do the best you can for people who don't have the same opportunities that you do. So I was kind of driven, very values driven, um, I think as a person, and that certainly impacted throughout my career. Um, so I've kind of climbed um, and traversed my career, really. I didn't just go in one great straight line up. I've taken um, different opportunities as they, they, they've appeared along the line. So I've worked both in health services, in social care, so private kind of care homes. I've worked in an academic post. Um, I spent 10 years as the government nurse advisor for older people, which I thought was the pinnacle of my career. And now I'm currently working as the chief nurse for adult social care across England. So that's um, a post for six months initially. Uh, so I'm helping the government at the moment, particularly around the issues and challenges that COVID has posed to people, uh, to care homes in particular, and to the wider kind of social care community uh, workforce. So my career is traversed, it's, it's kind of meandered um, and not been a straight line. And I think that what I would say to, you know, young nurses out there is to don't be in a hurry to get to the top, take your time, get as much experience, not only in nursing. So go and try things out. I worked in all, you know, although I focused on older people, I did a specialist course quite early on in my career, but I've worked in medicine, uh, I've worked in surgery, um, I, you know, I've kind of worked, worked in an academic post. I've gone and experienced different things. And I truly think that has added up to the ability now. And I'm sat with government ministers um, to have very honest conversations because I've, I have that kind of knowledge and that experience to fall back on. So you have an authentic voice at the table. And I think as leaders, you have to just hold on to your values through as you kind of 
uh, you know, as you kind of meander through your career, you need to hang on to what you believe in and don't let people sway you. And I think those people that you come across, I know I've come across some really difficult, challenging individuals, is that don't let them stand in your way. And I was just looking at the uh, the kind of chat earlier and somebody was saying that they'd a young nurse applying to, um, I think she was somewhere in Asia, applied to uh, go on a leadership course and told not yet, go and learn to get some clinical stuff. Don't take no, go back you know, challenge people in the, in a very positive way, but go back and stand your ground on things. And that's sometimes really, really hard to do. But it's again, it's about your values and it's about your belief in yourself and in the profession more, more broadly. Um, and I think the other thing I'd really say to people, even those protagonists, those people that irritate you and those people that perhaps, you know, kind of draw the, the wrong things out of you is to always listen from to them because you will learn something about, um, about those individuals, but you'll learn something about yourself and you'll learn how to um, deal with those, you know, those kind of similar personalities in the future, really. And I think, like I say, don't go up to, don't go up that ladder too quickly. Go and take stopping off points. And the one thing that I regret not doing more of is taking more time out to reflect as I went along my journey. Um, I was, you know, very committed, you know, always the first in in the morning and the last in that person out at night. And I don't think I took enough time to stand back and sometimes think about myself and what I wanted. And I think that's really, really important that we all have a right to think about what we want as well as what we're expected to do by others. So that would be one of my critical bits of advice is, to, is just to stop and think and reflect and just consider um, and, and not be, you know, um, not, 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 be, not be rushing through it. You know, 40 years has flown by. I can't believe that I'm virtually at the end of my career now. I, you know, I see the end of my, my kind of full time career in the next few years. And then we'll, we'll look to do some more, you know, interesting and flexible um, kind of ways of working. It flies by. It goes so quickly. But the thing that I think is so fundamentally wonderful about nursing is it not only teaches you, you know, to be a great nurse and all those experiences, be a great leader, but it teaches you about life and it teaches you about people. In a way, when I look at, you know, my lot of my friends and my family uh, are not nurses. Lots of them work in lots of different fields. They're lawyers, they're accountants, they're teachers, they're ship's captain, whatever they are. They, um, in, they don't have that experience of people and of life. And I think the privilege of and the intimacy of the relationships that we have stands you in good stead, um, I think, for dealing with those difficult, um, those difficult pe people that we meet along our kind of pathway. Um, and like I say, I think it's just not, just don't take no for an answer. You know, have that, find that tenacity within yourself to keep going. And the tough times, I probably learned the most about myself. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, if it's not right for you, if you're in a job where it's not right for you, there is another job and you don't have to stay. You can go on and do something else and take that experience. You know, I can think of, um, a job that I had in my career and um, I, I got there and within three weeks I regretted it and I stuck it out for 18 months and at 18 months I thought either I'm going to end up in a psychiatric unit because they are going to drive me mad um, I'm going to um, you know become as indifferent this is working with people who didn't didn't share my values or I'm going to have to leave. And I went off and did um, my master's degree full time. And I worked as a, I went from a very senior nursing position and I went and worked in care homes as a, as a nurse, mostly on night duty. There are, you know, there's always a solution. You don't have to be trapped somewhere where you're unhappy. And I think, again, there are times that when I look back and I think I stayed too long in some jobs and I, I, I should have gone earlier. Um, so I think listen to yourself, this, you know, take, take the experience of all those people and all that wisdom around you but listen to to what you want as well um, and don't be swayed from your course really Deborah yeah. thank you you know that I'm always in awe of you and and your story I think it's absolutely amazing I think one of the things that you know it's it's very um inspiring about your story is that you know you were talking about working in in with older people and my, I've also started in my career working with older people. And it's interesting, I don't know if you had that, um, but it was kind of an area that didn't seem to attract many nurses. And actually people looked, other colleagues looked at you 
kind of in a way that wasn't yeah. the greatest. So, so it's it's really you know wonderful to hear um you know your story and how you started from there and and went in so many different directions uh, and like you said not in a straight line. I wanted to ask you something, Deborah, and I don't know if 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 you know the answer, but I'm just thinking about various different people that are uh, watching us today from very different countries. The UK is quite exceptional in the sense that we have uh, nurses being invited uh, by government uh, to tell that you know their opinions to they, they are consulted. And uh, when do you think that started happening in the kind of the UK healthcare history? I'm thinking about countries where that is probably unimaginable at the moment. Yeah. What, uh, what do you think that happened in the UK for, for nurses to be invited to sit at that table? Um, I, I don't actually know the history, but that's going to make me go and look for it now because I think that's <laughs> a really interesting. I think it was probably, um, I think it was probably at, at a government level. I think probably not until the seventies, eighties that that was happening. Uh, in, in, you know that, that that actually happened, and obviously the UK is four devolved countries. So we, you know, the, the, each of the uh, devolved administrations have a chief nurse um, who obviously uh, gives that political advice. Um, and I'm, I'm not I'm not sure how it came about. What I think is really important and, and, and my kind of take on it now and the role that I sit in. And so every month, the minister that I have a relationship with, we sit down on a one to one and have a very open conversation. Um, and I think that um, what you're able to do as a voice in government, as a nursing voice in the, gov at the government table is to is to bring the reality so when everybody's having great ideas about we can do this and we can do that, you can translate that down, not, not, not only in terms of how that impacts on nursing, but how that impacts on people mm. and the, the real lives of real people. Because we as nurses have this wealth of experience, you know, when you've gone into um, situations in the community, you know, you've seen poverty, you've seen you know, kind of the challenges about uh, about staffing on the wards. You have this, you you kind of experience different cultures, clinical cultures. Um, you know, so I think it's it's that voice of reality that that I think is so absolutely critical at a government level. Um, and and I, and I think the like I say it's about that auth authentic bit. It's about the authenticity um, of that voice at the table. Um, and I think that once, whenever that happened, and I think it was probably the 70s, um, 80s, is that the other thing about, about the UK is obviously it's got this long history of, uh, and, you know, Florence Nightingale, you know, as we talk about the uh, Nightingale Challenge, you know, we've, we have that, you know, we, it was the birthplace of nursing on this, wasn't it? So that, that kind of, um, you know, that huge history has helped us. And I think some of those very fierce women, because it was predominantly women, those fierce matrons of hospitals, um who were you know who were hugely respected so um you know and, and that kind of authority and also the hierarchy that's probably where it's come from as well the hierarchy and that military kind of um structure so it's kind of been inherent in the uh, in the kind of profession here in the uk for for well for centuries really you now it's you know for a very very long time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And, I, you know, you've mentioned something, you know, that's predominantly women. In, and that makes me think as, as a male nurse, it makes me think that in a way, uh, because we live in a world that it's still, you know, where gender inequality is very much an issue everywhere. Yeah. I mean, there's no country yeah. in the world yeah. where women earn the same as men, for example. Um, yeah. Because, you know, nurses around the world are predominantly women. I think that also really is um, something that affects, you know, and it, it's not an obstacle, but it, it does affect how nurses are seen and yeah. respected yeah. and whether they're listened or not. Uh, uh, and, and it kind of, is, so it's really comes together with that gender equality debate, doesn't it? And, and, and you can, it's so palpable. It's yeah. so palpable. And, and that kind of imposter syndrome, you know, I, I, you know, I have that even with those years of experience behind me, I think, what am I doing here? You know, why are they asking me? How can I possibly, you know, add anything to that? And, mm. um, you know, I, I think not, it, it, we, it's very difficult, I think, for women. I do think it's difficult for women to um, sometimes find their voice and that, like I said, that imposter syndrome. Um, 
but actually it's about going back to your values and it's going back to the people that you serve the people that you know that we look after it's it's been you know it's that absolute critical uh, component of nursing which is advocacy and just reminding ourselves that advocacy is at the heart of everything we do we speak on behalf of those um those patients when you're in those situations mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. and that really really important yes yes uh, thank you very much deborah thank you that's inspirational that's the way I, I i i put it it is it is and <laughs> Angelo, um, last but not least, Angelo, I have to say that Angelo uh, is joining us from Canada, from the um, um, West Coast in the Pacific. It's four o'clock in the morning. So I can't thank you enough, Angelo, for uh, uh, for joining us. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with Angelo. Um, and I think Angelo is one of the most kind of inspiring nurses I've met. He has this ability to motivate, to uh, cite, to uh, really stimulate his students. Um, So Angelo, in a way, I'm gonna ask you a similar question to to Deborah. Um, What advice would you give to newly qualified nurses who have just entered the job, who don't know what to expect? Uh, That's one of the things I wanted to ask you. And the other thing, I'm actually going to pick up on this question that we have here, which I think that Deborah uh, touched briefly. We have a question uh, from Ade from Indonesia, who says, hi, everyone. In the beginning of my career as a pediatric nurse, I have been not allowed to join a leadership training, even though I passed the selection. Uh, The head of HR where I worked said I was not suitable enough because I was too young. Instead of focus on leadership, I should focus on other clinical training and practice. Angela, you've met a lot of people throughout your life. You work in addition to giant mental health with the International Canadian Red Cross, and you meet people in kind of very desperate, difficult situations. Uh, What advice would you give to Ade, and again, to any kind of a newly qualified nurse that has entered a job and is doesn't know what to expect from it. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Angelo, and uh, listening to to Deborah speak, it was interesting to to think back and reflect back on 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 my career and why I went into nursing. And I I actually did not choose nursing. I was um, I was sort of struggling at the time, deciding what I wanted to go into. And um, I actually started university for accounting and and was looking at a career as an accountant. But in the interim of that, I started working, volunteering at a hospital where I was working with a little boy with uh, a seizure disorder. So he was having 20 to 30 seizures per day. And I was sort of his companion, sort of this nurse's aide. And Um, really enjoyed doing that. And then the following summer, I ended up getting a job in an accounting firm where I was sort of practicing which uh, what I was going to school for. And that summer, I hated it. I hated what I did. I sat there working on numbers, working on spreadsheets, and could not stand doing that. And thought about my time working with this boy. And um, at that point in my life, I sort of pivoted and said, no, I want a profession where I'm connecting with people, where I'm working with people, because that's where I feel most fulfilled and ended up switching into a psychiatric nursing program. And that's that's what I started uh, my education in. I'm a a dually trained nurse. I, I started in psychiatry, but also have my general um, nursing. Uh, going back at, at looking back, like that was 30 years ago, I don't know if I knew where I wanted to go with that. The, the thing I knew I enjoyed doing was how I connected with people. And when you're talking about working in nursing, you're connecting with people at the most vulnerable times in their life. Most of the times it's, it's with some illness, unless you're working in maternity and, and pediatrics, it's, it's usually during um, a crisis or something that's, that's atypical from their normal life. 
And I've spent most of my, my career in community mental health. So I've worked in community adult mental health for 12 years, and that was the very start of my career and had the opportunity to connect with people at many different levels and to experience different things. And then moved into older adult and started working with people uh, with dementia in their homes and their family members. And then uh, Further on in my career, I went on to coordinate violence prevention programs. Uh, like Joao just mentioned, I'm part of a disaster team with Canadian Red Cross that goes into disaster zones um, uh, after a big disaster. So I was in Nepal when the earthquake happened and we set up uh, an emergency response unit in Nepal shortly after the earthquake. Going back to your career or, or your question is, you know, what advice would I have for, for early career nurses that are just starting off? I think for me, what worked for me is being aware and um, of the opportunities that are out there. I think there are, in nursing, there are many opportunities. And I think it's very easy to say, oh yes, this is where I wanna go and this is where, where uh, my passions are. Yeah, I think that's important to keep in mind, but to also look at other opportunities that are, are along the way and to be open to them. Uh, in Canada, it's a little different because we, we, like the UK, we have uh, a, a, quite a good social system in terms of our healthcare and everything is sort of regulated and government controlled. Actually, my very first job in mental health, I didn't work for the government. We worked in a society that was a very grassroots society that looked at how to support people with mental illness that are living in the community. There was a big transition in the 80s from uh, people with mental health issues living in institutions and then deinstitutionalization where people were being cared for in their homes and in different parts. So that gave me a good opportunity to look at how we can connect with people. And I think when I go back to sort of the lessons I've learned through all the different areas I've worked with is getting back to how you connect with people and connecting with people is, is listening to people. You know, I think uh, sometimes uh, we can, especially when I look back at my Red Cross stuff, when I go into disaster zones um, shortly after a disaster, people are affected in many different levels following a disaster. What can you do to make that, that change? Sometimes you can't change anything. The disaster is the disaster. I think working in mental health specifically has given me uh, the opportunity to learn the skill of active listening and to really to share that experience with someone, whatever that experience may be. So whether that's in the community setting, in an acute setting, in an inpatient city, what is that person's experience? And um, what is the thing that they are going through? And how can I give them space to support them and to help them sort of move forward from that spot? So um, I guess looking back and looking at the two things I would look at is how we connect with people and how we listen to people and share space with people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Angelo, you 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 spoke about you know again listening to people how important that is, and I'm thinking about uh, um, conflict resolution, which I think it's something that you um, often you know deal with and discuss with your with your students and when you go out with the Canadian uh, Red Cross because conflict is so much part of life, right? And um, I have a question here, and I was wondering from a lady called Regina, Regina Mankamba. Uh, she is the executive director of the National Organizations of Nurses and Midwives of Malawi. And Regina says, I would like to check on your thoughts for a situation where a private health facility 
pays nurses and other health professions differently, although they are all on the same grade. And she's saying, how would you advise? So I think what, what uh, Regina is saying, we've got a situation here where there's kind of different members of staff all on the same level. The organization is paying them differently. How can we respond to this? Uh, uh, how can we challenge this really? Uh, which is something that we've been talking about as well. Any, any thoughts on, on, on how, how we would go about this? Hmm. So, so my career actually is community mental health. And in, in a community health setting, there is, it's not just all nurses. There are doctors, there's nurses, there's occupational therapists, there are social workers, and there are counselors. And as uh, working in community mental health, you're working in a team, a, a multidisciplinary team. Um, it's a little different in the sense that it's, it's not all the same profession. They're not all nurses, but there are different pay grades within that. So whether you're, and, and now on our teams, we have peer support workers. So peers that, that work. And there are varying grades of pay based on what your educational profile or is. And sometimes that does cause animosity because you're, you're all basically doing the same work, but you're getting paid for different ways around doing that. Um, I, I think it, it, it depends on looking at yourself and the fairness that you feel around that. You know, uh, when I go into a job, it is around the work. And yes, the, the pay comes afterwards, but is it is around the work. And is it the work I want to be doing? Is this something that I enjoy doing? Is this something where I feel fulfilled in it? So yes, pay makes a big difference in terms of that, but it's not the only factor around that. And I think that's important to have a discussion if that's possible within your teams and with your management um, areas around uh, the discrepancies in pay. Um, yes, you know, I, I was thinking, um, Angela, as I was uh, uh, hearing you talking and also going back to Regina's question, in the UK is very much like you described in Canada. So Regina, I don't know if this helps or not, but in the UK we have, you know, you have nurses under the same grade, but different pays uh, within that grade. Uh, so it could be because, you know, um, nurses have a, a longer years of experience in a certain job. So you might be a band five, for example, but you've started in your job six months ago, and then you have a colleague who's also a band five nurse, but he or she has been around for three years. So maybe uh, his or her pay is a bit higher than, than the nurse who just started in his or new or hers a new, a new job. I think the other thing that it's quite important and that we've been talking about here is issues like mentorship, uh, professional development opportunities to have a logbook where nurses can actually record uh, what they do uh, so that there is evidence that you can show to your employers of what you're doing, what your jobs and, and duties and responsibilities are. And that also then is reflected on your pay. So I think there is kind of governance a governance framework that can support kind of a fair um, uh, payment system uh, within um, healthcare within healthcare settings. Uh, we've got questions, Lisa. I can see yeah, hi. Thank you for that. I just wanted to chip in to say that um, nursing now is doing some brilliant work around lobbying, and there's this toolkit called Nursing Together and about ways in which that early career nurses and every other, you know, never mind early career nurses, whatever um, stage you're at, how you can effectively lobby um, for, for the right things and for the right things to happen. So I just probably urge people to look at that and maybe Hannah could send the link out because I think pay is an issue, but if we don't lobby in the right way, it feels like all we're ever talking about is pay and then we lose sight or people forget all the other brilliant things that we do for society and uh, and those important issues about you know creating better and more health for everybody thank you
And thank you for doing an amazing job in chairing this brilliant session. Really appreciate it. Lisa, do you want do you want me to wrap up? Do you want me Yes, that would be an absolute yeah. pleasure. Yes, thank you. Thank and, you very and... much. Thank you, Lisa. And Harriet, I can see that we've got time for one last quick question. Harriet, you've got your hands up. Yes, I also wanted to respond to Regina's question. Uh, I have gone through that experience. I have worked in a facility where there was that challenge. At that time, I had just the Nursing Now campaign and got the enthusiasm to be change in the place, to be the change that I really need to, to see. So in that environment, there are different professionals. For example, a receptionist is holding a diploma and a nurse is holding a diploma. And you would find that the receptionist or any other profession is getting much more pay than what a nurse is being paid. What I realized is that uh, all nurses and midwives were not happy about this and they had sat for a long time realized that Harriet had a voice and I myself thought I could stand in to speak but how to speak I had to organize myself and during the meetings the, the, the staff meetings where the different the health facility attended I had to stand up and speak out what I did was to explain to them what Nursing is as a profession, also to let them know that we are not doctors and assistants. Because most uh, employers, especially in private sector, think that doctors are higher than nurses, that from nursing, upgrade and become a doctor. So that makes us get a lower pay, which is very, very stigmatizing for the nurses and midwives. So from that time, they realized what I was speaking was very, very good. And they started paying keen attention to it. I'm sure that they were able to be added pay. Those not enough, but at least confidence. And they are also happy. So that challenge that is have, we are having nursing and midwifery profession, and it is exaggerated in Africa where nurses and midwives are many and then doctors are very few and they are seen to be serious for us we are there to wheelchairs that is the experience i got that we are supposed to be advocates from the lower level yes. from the lower level thank you very much harriet thank you regina i hope that that um, gave you some ideas uh, and some hope that things can change uh, in Malawi as well. Um, and I think we just have time now to wrap up and to thank everyone for joining us in this panel. Uh, thank you everyone for everybody that, that was listening to us um, at home. Um, there is um, a, a lot of materials are available on the Nursing Now webpage. Um, I think uh, and Hannah just shared, for example, the Nurses Together Toolkit. You can see it on the on the chat. Um, there, we, there is also, like I said before, more information on the actual challenge uh, on the Nursing Now webpage and on the uh, Nightingale Challenge Global Solutions Initiative Facebook uh, group. Um, we really look forward to uh, receiving your proposals uh, and do get in touch. And um, we will meet you again, hopefully on the 12th of May. Uh, time will be confirmed. And, and looking forward to seeing you all again. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the panelists. It's been really lovely to see some of you again, to meet the ones that I didn't know before. And I look forward to, to getting together again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Stay safe, everybody. You too. You too. Thank you, Amina. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zalesh.